started. Uh, my name is Erik Ylupe, and I work at the Research Institutes, Institutes of Sweden, RISE. Uh, but I also work in the Competence Center ENCCS, where we, we help uh, Sweden with the high-performance computing, the high-performance data analytics, and the AI uh, in the Euro HPC project. So we, we named this webinar Creative AI. I'll, I'll dive a bit deeper into that. Um, what, what kind of creative are we talking about here? But before that, one of the reasons for why I want to do this is kind of the, the impact we're seeing from uh, these AI models, finally, I would say. So we who have been in the field have, have uh, worked with these kind of models for a long time. So I started working with them in 2015. Uh, these models, which essentially generates uh, text uh, based on a prompt, so you could you could in theory implement a question answering systems, but they were they were really poor. Uh, so the last couple of years has seen a tremendous uh, improvement in these in these methods. So before I start talking about the topic, some words on myself. So. As I said before, I'm a researcher at, at RISE, the Research Institutes of Sweden. Uh, I've had kind of a, a, a bendy path, <laughs> perhaps. So I actually started in computer science, but then I switched to, to arts and craft, uh, which I pursued for quite some, some time. So I really, I was really fascinated by, by the creative process and by creating things. So mostly using metals or, or ceramics, that was my my main materials of choice. Uh, it le le and made me end up in Stockholm and studied the the Royal College of Arts and Craft, uh, Konstfack. But really, uh, art, uh, I was likely not cut out to be an artist. Uh, I didn't really have the passion for for art, which I think you need to to try to make a living out of it. So I switched to computer science and that's kind of been my path since uh, the last uh, decade and a half. So I started at KTH and then at Uppsala University where I delved into AI uh, mainly from a computer scientist background. And then I started at the Swedish Institute of Computer Science which was then merged into this research institute of Sweden. So RISE is a uh, large research institute, Sweden's Sweden's uh, main uh, research institute. We are owned by the Swedish government. We are uh, uh, a institute which have have approximately it says two thousand eight hundred here. Those numbers are a bit old. We are closer to three thousand now, and we are divided in a in a number of different divisions. We also have a, a goal to help. Uh, Swedish industry and public sector mainly, also academia, but being kind of a bridge between between academia and and the, the industry mainly. Uh, we have a lot of different areas we work in. Here are just a couple of them uh, for the the industry collaborations we do. And we're spread out uh, all over Sweden. So I'm in the very northern part of Sweden in Luleå, while. Uh, uh, many of my colleagues are in the Stockholm area. Uh, we also have have operations in other countries in Europe. Uh, Tour has already told you about ENCCS, but I'll, I'd just like to add that this is a truly ambitious uh, ambitious undertaking by the European Union, trying to build really a first-class computational infrastructure in Europe. Uh, so do have a look at our web webpage if you need any kind of compute. Uh, the, the kind of resources available to you for free are staggering. So uh, outline of the of today. So we'll start with talking a bit about you know creative AI. That's the topic of, of today. But then I I will delve deeper into a certain perspective on creative AI. And in particular, I will talk about uh, my favorite topic, which is representation learning. This will lead us uh, into generative models. Uh, then we will we'll have a, a short break. So this will be a time for you to have a first reflection uh, on this and write some questions, preferably in the HackMD document, but you can also write them in chat. And then we'll take a short time to, to discuss these first questions. Uh, 
And after that, we continue on to talking about chat GPT and language models, followed by a short break and then kind of the wider implications of these generative models, where we'll try to give you some, some kind of reference points on other things than the, let's say, uh, technological. We'll end by having a, a final question answering sessions where I hope we, we can get some really interesting discussions going. So then on to what is creative AI? So this is a, a very difficult concept to pin down. So one very influential uh, researcher in the field of, well, both AI in general, but also in creativity and in artificial intelligence is Margaret Bowden. So she has a long career of writing on, on AI and its implications uh, in, in relation to humans. So she has this to say about AI that, that essentially a lot of what uh, creative people do is what she says combinatorial or exploratory. And what she means by that is that it's it's essentially simple synthesis of things we already know. Well, then she said that, uh, you know, the other 5% is the transformational creativity, the creativity which really leads to completely novel and uh, surprising things. And at least from her perspective, what we can do with AI is to use them as models for trying to understand these mechanisms. Uh, personally, I'm more more uh, in line with another very influential AI researcher called Jürgen Schmidhuber. So Jürgen Schmidhuber uh, is one of the most important uh, researchers in the field of neural networks, and in particular, reinforcement learning using neural networks. So he has this rather long quote, uh, but I, I will read it because I think it's important. So he's, he has this this complete theory of how how intelligence actually works. Uh, but he argues that data becomes temporarily interesting by itself to some self-improving but computationally limited subjective observer once he learns to predict or compress the data in a better way, thus making subjectively simpler or more beautiful. So essentially what he's saying is that uh, we continually try to create a explanation of the things we observe using some kind of uh, model because we, we are limited in the kind of memory we have. We need to compress what we have seen. And he, he argues that our sense of beauty or... or uh, our sense of satisfaction from, from observing things comes from how well they fit into our model and how good they add to our model. So then he said that curiosity is the desire to create or discover more non-random, non-arbitrary, regular data that is novel and surprising. And here's a bit technical things, but essentially that they're novel and surprising in that they help us build a better model of the things we have observed and the things we will observe. Um, so in his, his view, uh, creativity is a drive we have to make more efficient explorations of the world or more efficiently build this internal model of the world we have, which help us act. And he also argues that uh, humor uh, and curiosity are, are tightly linked to these concepts that humor is really has a lot to do about this surprisingness uh, the surprising uh, yet still not completely random new uh, experience so these two perspectives on ai or or creativity in ai are on a high level uh, but I, I would like to kind of summarize them like this or, or rather perspectives on ai like this so one perspective on creativity in AI could be that it's about the act of creating something. So something new gets created. While another perspective, and the perspective I think uh, Schmidt Huber exemplifies in the previous slide, is that creativity is a drive in agents to create something. Uh, so a wall of text, uh, there won't be much of these in the talk, but a lot of the discourse around creative AI is about the first kind. So the kind about something gets created. And in this view of creativity, it's a kind of probabilistic view of creativity. We can see a creation as a sample from some very 
complex probability distribution. We'll talk more about this. Uh, and But these are, are essentially what we call generative models. So different kind of, of AI, the AI which Schmidt Huber talked about, is really about the creativity as a drive, as an intrinsic drive of a, of a learning agent uh, to create new things for its own pleasure. Uh, this is not what we will we'll talk about today. We'll talk about the, the former. Uh, AI things which essentially create things uh, regardless of whether there are any built-in drive. But before we start to talk more about these kind of creative models, uh, I thought I'd have a brief, you know, uh, overview of AI. So this talk doesn't assume that you are very well versed in AI. You should probably ha have uh, read about it uh, in a popular science way. And I will continue to give you kind of a top side explanation. First of all, AI, it's a very vast field. Uh, a lot of people might associate it or conflate it with machine learning. Uh, that is what we will talk about today. But it's important to realize that machine learning is just one way of trying to create AI. And what is it that we try to create? Well, I, I like this definition because it's kind of vague. <laughs> it doesn't try to pin down what intelligence is, which is really a recurring hard problem in, in AI. Um, but essentially we say that AI is a study of, of machines which solve problem which humans uses intelligence to solve. So it kind of uh, uses uh, problems as the unit of, of analysis instead of, of intelligence as the unit of analysis. So in AI, few directly study machines that learn and think like humans. It's more focused on these problems we can solve. What we're seeing now is perhaps a, a kind of shift that we're starting to talk about the <laughs> questions like philosophy of mind or, you know, does this AI understand language? Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that today, but if you're interested uh, in the discussion session, we can try to elaborate on that. So more technically, an AI can be seen as an algorithmic problem solver. So an algorithm is a set of instructions which takes some kind of input or some kind of state performs a set of operations which transforms the input or the state to some new state or an output. And a classical example of this, which a lot of people uh, learn, is uh, long division. And this highlights an, an algorithm doesn't have to be implemented in a computer. An algorithm can be used by humans and have been for, for uh, thousands of years. Now, traditionally, when we talk about the algorithms, we think of computer programs. And most, most algorithms are uh, implemented in computer programs by defining a set of rules. Rules which determine how this input, in this case, this defines what's called the Fibonacci function, taking some, some natural number, some integer, some positive integer, uh, n, uh, it describes how to calculate its Fibonacci number. So it's defined by this set of rules. Now, there are also other kind of algorithms which are not defined by rules, but rather by, by some kind of uh, function with a lot of what we call free parameters. And what we can do with, with those kind of functions is that we can adjust these free parameters to make the algorithm compute different things. And this is essentially what machine learning is all about. So we can think of this, this function as kind of a mixer board or a, a analog filter, which have all of these but buttons we can adjust to change the what it computes. Uh, the way we do this is that we start with some kind of reference data. Uh, this data is typically in the, in the shape of some kind of input and the desired output or target for the data. And then this model with free parameters. What we do then is that we we feed the input data into our model with free parameters. It has a lot of it performs a lot of computations using the current setting of these parameters to produce an output. Then we compare the output to the desired target and try to adjust the uh, the settings so that it gets closer to the desired target, the output of the model. 
And then to to be able to do this, uh, to get a, a model which is actually able to go, give desired outputs for a large, uh, large range of, of different inputs, in particular inputs it hasn't seen before, we use lots and lots and lots of these kind of pairs of input and target data, different kinds of pairs. This helps the model to understand how different kind of inputs should, should map to different kind of desired outputs and hopefully be able to interpolate between uh, these kind of these kind of inputs. Then we, we try to assess how good it's doing at this interpolation and also extrapolation, but that's harder, by essentially testing it on more of these kind of pairs, which it hasn't seen before. So that's the brief uh, explanation of machine learning. I'll also give a, a bit more technical explanation. So essentially talking a bit more about this statistics, because what we actually do is that we we train uh, statistical models or we use statistics to build these learning algorithms. So I'll just try to briefly give you an idea of, of how to think about this. Let's so imagine there is some kind of process. Uh, we don't know anything about the process. In this case, it's represented by this uh, wheel of fortune or this spinning wheel. So we can spin the wheel and it will end up on some color we can't see the actual spinning and we don't know it's a wheel. We only see the color it generates. So we call this a data generating process, which is observed, uh, sorry, unobserved. We only observe these events, but we can collect statistics about these events and thereby trying to characterize this process somehow. So we say we can do this kind of frequency diagram or histogram where we see that certain events are more likely than other. We don't know why necessarily, uh, but we can use these statistics to try to build a model of this phenomena. So the model here is, is represented by this dice. This dice has corners where we can change the position of them. This will essentially change the, the faces of the die, which will in turn change the probability of getting certain results. So let's say we start with a, a fair die uh, and we throw it a lot of times and we will get a, a pretty much equal result uh, of, of uh, the values of the die. But then imagine that we, we compare these results with the absurd uh, statistics from this uh, hidden process. And then we adjust the corners of our dice so that when we roll it, it will produce a similar uh, statistical uh, profile, so to say, as the absurd statistics. And this is kind of the key of, of what we're trying to do here. Uh, the well, with all of these data sets I showed you uh, previously on the previous slide, we try to adjust uh, the parameters, in this case represented by the corners of this die, to match the statistics of some uh, some unknown uh, phenomena from which we have gathered statistics. Now, one key question in, in machine learning, and which I will uh, spend the rest of this uh, first session to talk about is that of representations. So representation has has long been one of the, the key uh, questions of AI. How do we represent problems or data uh, to make automated decision making easier or simple? So what we mean by this, uh, I'll give you a toy example to highlight the what difference representations make. So imagine we have some data set with, with two different classes represented by the different colors here, uh, the, the teal and the, the pink. We would like to be able to tell what class a point should be depending on where it is in this two-dimensional space. Now, in the Cartesian coordinates, the, the classical X and Y coordinate system you might be used to, to uh, this problem is, is kind of hard or it can be made easier by instead of using a polar representation, which where each uh, point is represented by its angle from, from one axis and the distance from the origin. And you see in this representation, solving these problems becomes much easier. Uh, now this is just to, to kind of show a very simple example of, of how a very simple difference in representation can change solving the problem. The problem is really for complex data. Uh, how can we know what is a good representation? So for images, for example, for example, 
we know that that this grid of pixels is probably a poor representation for uh, telling us or automatically deciding what what kind of object is shown in the image. But how can we how can we create a better representation? So the the idea from the from the field of representation learning is to essentially try to learn a thing. We call it a transformation in this case. We can also think of it as a function, which takes data in one representation and maps it to a new representation where the problem is easier to solve. There are a lot of ways to try to do this, but the one we will talk about today is what's called deep learning. So the idea here is that representations of things are very useful if they are built as a kind of composition in a hierarchy. So I think this, this scene uh, graph to the left here represents this well. So this is really to, to illustrate how you could build a scene in computer graphics, but it kind of illustrates the concept of deep learning as well, that a complex uh, data, so in this case, a scene or a picture of a scene with a, a car and, and some windmills and a sun and a landscape can actually be broken down into simpler uh, things and then represent a uh, composition of those things. So for example, circles can be combined to be either a sun or a wheel uh, together with a line. And the way we combine them decides what kind of more complex thing it is. And then we can use those those complex things to build even more complex things. So the idea with deep learning is that these representations we learn are more useful or we learn them more efficiently if we structure the learning in a hierarchy. And to the right here, you see uh, from the deep learning book, an example where we start with pixels, then we start to gradually learn uh, more and more complex composition of the patterns these pixels form to finally be able to tell whether it's a, a car, a person, or an animal in a picture. So the idea of deep learning can be represented like this. So we start with some kind of data in, in a complex representation, which we can't really tease out. Uh, and then we have these uh, steps of transformations, which gradually goes from the complex representation to a very simple representation. So in this case, it would be to map any point in this two-dimensional space to the values zero or one. And we do this by this series, by these steps of computation, uh, steps of transformation. So that's all fine and good. We can do this with lots of data. Um, but the question is where we get lots of data. So where we, do we go get all of this data, which we need to build these good representations? So for deep neural networks, we typically need a lot of these uh, kind of data pairs. One way to do it is to have a human who actually, for any input, writes down what the desired output should be. And that has been one of the prevailing methods of doing this uh, up until, I would say, a couple of years ago. A better way to do it, or at least a cheaper way to do it, is to use the data itself. So what we can do is that we, we have our data, uh, and then we make some adjustment to it or some change to it, and then we use uh, the unchanged version as the target for our prediction. So we feed our model, for example, an incomplete sentence, which says the cat sat on the, and then the model should predict what the word to complete that sentence is. Or we could feed an image model, some kind of corrupted version of the image, and then ask the model to reproduce the, the real image. This could be like in this case, blurred, or it could be more complex things like removing parts of the image or uh, making a very, very low resolution image and ask it to upscale it. By doing this, we can essentially, we don't have to manually create these targets for our data. This has been a method employed by, by all of the methods we've talked today to be able to build these really powerful representations of, of data. So one of the classical ways of doing this uh, is what's referred to as an autoencoder. So this was uh, done in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, a lot of uh, work was spent on this. So we start with some, some image and we might corrupt the image uh, to make it harder for the model to learn a, a trivial solution to the problem, just copying it, just uh, 
doing nothing, <laughs> doing no transformation at all, learning nothing about the data, just copying each pixel through the whole pipeline. So instead, we, we encourage the network to try to take an image and recognize common patterns in this image. And then by using these common patterns, we combine them into something which, which should be the target image. So this is referred to as an autoencoder because we're essentially using the data itself uh, to create this model. What we're really interested in are these parts, the encoder and the decoder. The de uh, and I'll get to, to what we can use them for. We're not actually interested in necessarily solving the denoising de de task, perhaps it could be, but that's more of a proxy task to learn something more about something more general about images and how to represent them. So these latent descriptive factors, which we have here, these are our uh, our new representation of our image. So instead of using these pixels, we can now use these things as the representation of the image. And this is the key idea of, of representation learning. We can also th see these, these uh, representations uh, I showed you as kind of a different die, essentially. Uh, so we can actually sample from these representations. Imagine throwing a dice. And each time you throw the dice, we get different result. Uh, the result will still be kind of constrained from, from the, the representations created. But this allows us to generate new data, which kind of looks like the, the data we fed into the, this encoder. And this is the, the key idea of generative models that we essentially can take a random dice throw and we can feed it into our neural network to map that, that random dice throw, which means nothing, to a random image. What we can do then, if we, if we go the, the whole step, is that we take images, for example, an image of a cat lying in a sofa or an image of a dog lying in the grass and feed them to this encoder network. The encoder will essentially create different sets of dice uh, for the different encoded images, which when we then throw to get random results, uh, give different codes in a sense for the decoder network to generate. So in this way, we can condition the this decoder network on a uh, desired kind of space of, of images to generate, depending on some reference image. So this is uh, this is what's referred to as a variational autoencoder. Uh, very useful in the cases where you want to generate data which looks like some other data. So it ha has been used for, for example, for trying to generate novel molecules in, in drug design. So molecules which look like some other molecule but are slightly random variations of them. Now, before I continue further, I will talk about a specific way of of trying to learn these representations, which is not an autoencoder. So in this case, imagine that you had a lot of image, images and text pairs. What you can do with them is that you have two separate encoders. You encode them to this, imagine this, this set of dice. Uh, in this case, it's represented by a, a vector point in some very high dimensional space. And what you try to train these two encoders to do is make sure that the image uh, of a puppy running and the text which uh, which uh, belongs to this image, that these uh, get the same representation. So essentially that these vectors in high dimensional space are as close together as possible. Or you could think of it with the previous analogy that they get uh, sets of dice which are similar uh, to each other as possible. So one question is, if you do this, so you map uh, images to some some representation, what can I do with that? Well, essentially, you now have a new representation for the image uh, with or text, which is hopefully descriptive in some way. So what we do when we do this is that we hope that these descriptions in text of, of images and the images helps create meaningful representation in this representation space, because it has to somehow find what is common between these two data points. It can't, ju can't just look at the individual pixels. It needs to learn some, something more semantic about the image. 
One important thing we can use these things for is as kind of a search. So we can think of these representations of images as indices. So we map the images to some point in a vector space. Similar images or images which contain similar objects get close together in this in this vector space, or think of it as a high dimensional geometric space. Then we can, when we want to find similar things, we can use an encoding of the image as an index for making lookups in this data in this uh, database essentially. This is a prime example of this is reverse image search. So you take some image, you encode it into this vector space and compare it to all of the other encodings of images in this vector space to find the closest ones. And those are the matches in your data set. Now, what we can also do is that we can take this uh, text encoder in this case, and we can combine it with this autoencoder I showed you previously. So instead of using images to generate a set of dice, we can now use text to generate a set of dice but then use those set of dice, or the result of throwing them, to generate images. And this is the exactly the idea behind the image generating uh, models we have uh, perhaps seen. Uh, so one of them is called DALI from OpenAI, the same research company which uh, is behind ChatGPT. There are also, also stable diffusion and mid-journey and a lot of, well, sorry for the misspelling a lot of different uh, kind of image generating models. And interestingly, all the model, all the images you see here are generated by one of these, uh, one of these image generating network. Neither of these things are, are created by humans or none of these things are created by humans. It's not sketches drawn by human and it's not photographs taken by human of some real animal. All of them are completely generated using the process uh, shown in this picture. Now, what, how do we, how do we make this happen? Well, the thing we need is lots of data, which is in this form. So it's pairs of text and images. Um, so for example, a portrait of the of the AI researcher, Jürgen Schmidhuber, or a photo of a bumblebee. The way OpenAI did this is that they essentially scraped the internet for any pictures they found, uh, applied some filtering to them, and, and uh, trained their models on them. Now, they didn't release their data set, but there is an open source project called Lion, which aims to create a similar really, really large data sets. For example, one of the data sets called Lion 5B is 5 billion uh, pairs of text and uh, image in about 2 billion in English, about 2 billion in the other languages, and then uh, some other uh, images which were deemed to be uh, like other kind of images. Now the data set, Lion, only contains essentially an index of where to find all of these things. They do not provide you with the images. So to be able to build a data set, you have to yourself scrape the internet for these images. We'll get back to later why this is an issue uh, in a, a number of different ways. But it is uh, the case that these methods are, are truly remarkable in what they can produce. So while they might seem to mostly be of, let's say, perhaps novelty, but not, not only, uh, as I said, I've used them to create a lot of the images in this presentation, the ones which aren't aren't uh, from like scientific publications or uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber's photo, for example. While that is cute, it also has a really deep uh, usage. So this whole field of combining different what we call modalities is called multi multimodal machine learning. So traditional machine learning typically is stuck to perhaps a single modality. And in this modality, perhaps a single very narrow part of it. So for example, for appearance or let's say vision, uh, there were the, the task of, of vision or computer vision was divided into, or still is divided into a number of different tasks. Uh, same with sound or perhaps uh, now text isn't, isn't 
showed in the left picture here, but we can think of speech as another modality or, or language as a modality. But as that has typically also been broken down into many, many different small parts. What we hope we can do with multimodal learning is to actually build really good representations of, of uh, for example, language and images by combining the modalities, essentially letting one of them inform uh, the other, uh, which gets around this whole problem of labeling data. And it is also highly believed that this is one of the key aspects to human learning, that actually having multiple modalities in which we're able to learn uh, what things are uh, is really important for how we learn to recognize patterns. So just a reminder, this is our, our schedule. Uh, we're a bit, uh, uh, what do you say, not behind, the, the opposite of behind, ahead. ahead ahead of schedule, yes, which is a great, uh, great. It's typically the other way around. Uh, so I will now touch on, on perhaps one of the most uh, publicized things right now, at least. Uh, for me, uh, the, the generative image models is really super fascinating. And I showed it to my daughter, who is six, and she was lyrical. And for the first time, she said, wow, dad, you really have a cool job. Uh, so who knows, perhaps uh, AI research in making. But what, what I think really touches a lot of us when it comes to, you know, the profundity of the, the progress is the language models, and in particular, chat GPT. So here's just, I think, most of you who... who have tried this, have your own anecdotes of, of your interactions with, with the uh, question answering system. So I, I try to ask it a lot of things, but to try to kind of gauge, you know, what kind of, how detailed is, it knowledge, is its knowledge about things and its ability to make, uh, to see similarities between things. So I ask this question, which is technical, but in what way are transformers, differentiable neural computers, and neural Turing machines similar? So this is a very technical question. This has not been written about a lot, so there isn't much much literature on this on the web, uh, especially not in in 2000, uh, 2021, which is a cutoff date from for the data they have for training their model. But it's still able to take what it has assimilated about these different neural network learning algorithms and give a relatively good answer to it. It highlights the key aspect I, I would like it to see. So I know the answer to this, but it's an answer which isn't uh, you know public, uh, publicly known very well. So it's good. Uh, essentially, they, they are all things which have a memory. Uh, and you have to know this, this architecture quite well to realize that they, that they do and that they are similar in this way. Uh, so before we get further, let, let's start talking about uh, language modeling. So language modeling um, is a thing which has existed, existed for a long time. It's one of the first works was by Shannon in the, I think, uh, 1950s. Essentially, the question is, uh, how do we assign a probability to a sentence? So given two sentences, like the cat sat on the keyboard or the cat sat on the mat, which of these two sentences are more likely? Uh, and the way we typically do this is by, by constructing the question as a kind of next step prediction or fill in the blanks uh, problem. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But for, before we do that, let's review this, this slide. So remember, we we can think of what we're doing as having uh, there's some kind of uh, process which generates data. We can't observe the process either it's too complicated or too opaque to to observe the workings of the process. But we can observe the events it produces. So, for example, this wheel of fortune, uh, we can see what colors it finally ends up on, and using this, we can can aggregate statistics of these events. What we can then do is take some kind of model. This model will be a mathematical expression. Uh, in this case, we can adjust the model so that it will uh, produce a 
uh, a probability distribution similar to the one we observed from the real phenomena. And this is what, what most of uh, most of the kind of machine learning we talk about today uh, does. So it tries to match statistics from some uh, unknown process, some unknown data generating process using uh, using observations from that process and then using a model. So this is, we, we call this DICE or a neural network, we often refer to that as model. And this is where the, the kind of language model term comes from. So we're trying to build these probability distributions over language. And the way we do it, uh, in, in the case of, of uh, the GPT family of models, is that we essentially ask it to make continuations of a, of a sentence. So given uh, some kind of uh, prefix or some kind of prompt, uh, for example, the cat sat on the, we ask it to predict what will be the next word in the sequence. So, for example, in this case, we could think of, of it actually producing a probability distribution over all possible words it's, it knows. And in the case of these kind of neural networks, they typically have about 50,000 different uh, units they can combine. Now, these units aren't full words, uh, like, like shown here. They are, they are smaller, can be combined into arbitrary words, at least in English. Um, and then what they do is that they, they try to assign each of the word in their vocabulary a probability score. So for example, th this is just a, a small selection of, of words. So math, for example, uh, could have some probability, while keyboard, for example, could have a higher probability. So it's more likely to, to be keyboard in the next uh, word. While the word flying uh, is very rare to observe in this kind of uh, context. You rarely see the cat sat on the flying. It could be a flying mat. Uh, then you see a word like and, which is a very common word in, in all of language, all of English language, is very uncommon in the, this context. So it would, a good language model would in this case see that the cat sat on the and is not correct uh, grammar or very unlikely to be observed. All of these things are only driven by statistics. So there is no, uh, there is no rules uh, hard coded into these systems. They learn all of all of grammar and all of, of uh, semantics only by looking at uh, the co-occurrence of words in this in this manner. Now the neat thing with doing this thing is essentially that the first thing you see there, you could think of that as a question. Then you can let the model. Uh, use its prediction of the next word to make a continuation. So imagine we, we start with some kind of, of thing which denotes that this is the, the start of the, the sequence you should generate. So in this case, uh, I uh, illustrate it as a kind of a start token or a start word, which is not a word, word in the language, but just a control token, so to say. So then the neural network knows that when I see this thing, it means that it's a start of a, a, a thing. And then I should generate the thing which comes after start of thing. Then we ask it to, to start this, and it will pr produce a probability distribution. So for example, I, A, the, on, she, it, and they would be have different likelihood of occurring in text statistically. Uh, and then we can sample from this probability distribution, essentially throwing this dice. And we get one value. So in this case, perhaps V. We can then take this sample thing and put it back into the uh, sequence. So we essentially use the thing we, we sampled as the new starting point and then ask it to, to continue. So now, uh, given the thing you sampled, uh, predict what the next thing should be. And now perhaps, you know, the state, cute, cat, great, bad, the, these are words you can occur. It's unlikely <clears throat> that the occurs after the, so that has a very low probability score. While cat has a very high, because of course, uh, cat is one of the most common words. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, and then we can, once again, sample from this probability distribution and feed it back into our sequence. And 
in this way, we can uh, continue to uh, to kind of feed back what it has sampled to generate uh, any length of a string. But we need some way of knowing when to stop. So we also include some kind of end token. So when, when it predicts end, it will stop generating, or we know that it thinks it's done generating. We can ask it to continue to generate, but typically this is how we set up the generation process. So you could think of the start here as a question, and then uh, the GPT model is asked to continue filling in this, uh, this uh, answer based on this question. So I'm not going to delve deep into this topic. Um, it's kind of a very ske sketch-like overview of what the transformer neural network is. But this is a, a sp specific type of, of uh, model. So this, the dice or the, the uh, mixer board with the knobs, uh, which have proven to be very successful in modeling a wide uh, range of different things. So one of its key features is that it is not constrained to a certain uh, size of its input. It can take an arbitrary number of different things at it as its input, and then learns pairwise combinations of these things. These pairwise combinations become groups, uh, and then it learns new pairwise combinations of those groups. And it continues doing this in steps of transformation, uh, just like any other deep neural network, it's built up out of multiple different stages not shown in this picture. And finally, it produces a probability distribution for this missing word in this case. Uh, so transformers were, were introduced circa 2017, uh, and they they really taken the, taken the whole field of machine learning, uh, completely replacing previous models used for, uh, for text, for example. We also see them being used in a lot of other contexts. So one, one really important one is that of AlphaFold, where we saw them being used to, with good accuracy, predict how, how proteins will uh, fold geometrically. So the Transformer Neural Network, if you're interested in knowing more about this, we at the NCSS also organize a workshop. It's a very technical workshop uh, where you are assumed to, to know a lot already about machine learning which is uh, geared to what's called a graph neural network and transformers. So graph is essentially a, a set of things and the relation, the binary relationship between them. We can learn, uh, we can use those as inputs to neural networks. So what you see here is a graph and the transformer essentially learns to dynamically create a graph of its inputs. So let's, let's leave the transformer uh, behind. Uh, there are, Plenty of things you can read about Transformer online. Most of it will be technical, though. Uh, and let's get back to ChatGPT. So one downside of ChatGPT is that OpenAI, the research company behind ChatGPT, has not told us much about its its uh, construction. We they have some illustrations. That's what we will use uh, to try to infer uh, how it's built. But essentially, they start with, with this language model, and it's a really large language model, likely. <laughs> we, we are not sure. Uh, but it has likely uh, hundreds of billions of parameters. So hundreds of billions of, of the corners of the dice or the knobs you can turn. Uh, and what they start doing is training up language uh, modeling, like I showed before. Uh, they did this previously with a model called Chat, uh, sorry, GPT-3 which also well, was very uh, hyped, at least in the research community, but didn't reach outside as much as, as now ChatGPT has done. So the basic idea is you start with this uh, pre-trained language model, but then you want to make it uh, an expert at question answering. So what you do then is that you hire a lot of humans to write good answers to a large set of questions. So you create a label data set with questions and answers. And here, when you hire the humans, you're very specific uh, on how they should answer the questions. So the 
The policy documents uh, which OpenAI used as guidelines for the humans are open. You can read them. Uh, it's interesting uh, and it's seems like fairly good policy documents if you believe in liberal demo democratic values. Uh, then they use these question and answers to essentially continue training the model with language modeling, like I showed you. Give it the question as a prompt and ask it to, to con continue uh, the question, actually answering the question as the target for training. And you use this to, to train the model. Now, this has been done before uh, to a large extent. And while it's, it's certainly helpful to make the model understand how it should format its output, it's not that good in, for example, making it avoid toxicity or uh, giving, uh, avoiding answering harmful questions, for example. You can make it more likely to, to answer the questions you have in your question data set, but it's hard to make, make it, for example, avoid answering questions about illegal things. So one really important part of of uh, ChatGPT it is the introduction of what's called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, uh, it's a very general framework for uh, learning almost any learning agent. So it's a, it's a framework used not only in AI, but also in cognitive psychology to try to explain uh, certain uh, behavioral mechanisms. At the core, you can think of having an agent, so in this case represented by the hamster here, trying to uh, act uh, in good ways in some kind of complex and changing environment. So the example here is that this hamster should try to navigate this, this cardboard maze. Uh, we, we can try to make it do this uh, in better ways by rewarding it when it uh, performs the set of tasks we would like it to do. So this is, is very close to classical conditioning. So, you know, the uh, Pavlov's dogs with, with, with a bell and, and salivation and so on, if you are familiar with this. So essentially, uh, the agent performs an action, uh, the environment evaluates that action and gives a reward uh, corresponding to the, the fitness of that action. And in this framework, we can, we can train a lot of different agents to perform really impressive things. So to previously publicized impressive things were AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero and AlphaStar. So the research company DeepMind, owned by, by Alphabet, uh, the Google, uh, uh, Google uh, mother company, they, they have worked a lot with reinforcement learning, where you essentially can use reinforcement learning to make a computer play the, the really hard game Go at a superhuman level. Or you can make a, a computer agent play the, the game StarCraft II at a competitive level. So StarCraft II is, is much harder uh, than Go for some, for, for some reasons. The major one is that in Go and chess and most board games, you have all of the information of the game's current state uh, available to you. While in a game like uh, StarCraft, you typically only see uh, select parts of of the game state. So much of the game state is unknown, which makes it typically a much, much harder game to, to actually play well. Uh, but both of these games were uh, tackled using reinforcement learning with great success. And we've seen this these framework being used for, for a lot of the impressive uh, achievements the last couple of years in AI. Unfortunately, they typically need huge amounts of experience to learn anything useful at all. So for example, here, AlphaGo Zero was trained by, with almost 5 million games of Go uh, before it, uh, or AlphaGo Zero, I should say, before it, it outperformed AlphaGo, its predecessor. So that's how much time it needed uh, before even being uh, competitive with its predecessor. And AlphaStore was first trained to mimic how humans play the game on, on almost a million matches from 22% of the best ranked players in the world. And then using uh, something equivalent of 200 years per uh, 
per competitive AI agent. So it, it was actually a group of agents competing against each other, and each of them had, had a roughly 200 years of playing StarCraft experience. So the, this, while this uh, can be done, if you have a perfect simulator, as in a game, uh, inside a computer. So these 200 years of StarCraft, you can actually, actually accelerate that to being only some weeks or so. Or 4.9 million games ago, you can do do also in, in a couple of days. But the problem is when we come to things which we human might care more about, like, for example, being able to say whether language is good or not, uh, it's much, it's been a thought that uh, this framework cannot be used easily because humans cannot give feedback uh, cannot can cannot spend read 5.9 million question answers to give feedback or at least it's it's prohibitively costly to do so but what the the idea in uh, chat gpt is not that uh, difficult so instead of you know having a human manually training the ai what they did is they created a human based or, or a new data set, essentially, where human rate answers uh, generated by the, the model trained first step. So the DG GPT model, this language model, which had been tuned to generate answers, then got to generate a lot of answers for questions. And then humans uh, ranked these answers by, by uh, some conditions also given by this policy document which really tries to enforce that it should uh, it should be correct it should be non-toxic it should be respectful of, of democratic values and respectful of humans and avoid uh, a lot of uh, essentially negative language use then they took these rankings from humans and they train a neural network to uh, be a proxy for those humans so essentially train a neural network to look at text and rank it or uh, give it a, a rating. Is this a good text or bad text? So here we're essentially training a neural network to become this environment for this reinforcement learning agent, which can then be used to make the model uh, try to generate things. And then we use the automatic rater or automatic critique to give a rating to what model generates. So here, the this re reward model, which is called, is uh, continuously giving feedback to the uh, generator model on how good answers it generates. And this should prove to, to actually work really well. So this is the really the, the key ingredient which makes chat GPT so much better than the regular GPT-3. Uh, they, they have published another paper about uh, called Instruct GPT, where they do the same thing. But Chat GPT is likely the continuation of that. A lot more work put into both data gathering and training. Now, one interesting thing about this as well is that this can easily continue to scale. So by continuing gathering high quality data here, by using uh, better and better uh, generated answers here, as the input for the human ratings, you can actually improve this data set, which improves this reward model, which improves uh, the generation model. And it, it can kind of feed back. So as long as you are willing to, to take the help of humans to generate a better and better data set, uh, the, the quality of chat GPT will likely only improve. But of course there are downsides. Uh, and one of them is that uh, chat GPT is essentially oblivious to facts. So here's an example where I ask chat GPT to generate or give me uh, some references to seminal papers on, on where machine learning is used to model bumblebee flight. Uh, and it gives me, uh, I, I cut it off, it, it gave me four, but, but it was hard to read in the presentation. But it gives me three really good references. Uh, these are definitely believable to be to be real papers. So the title looks real. The author list, well, makes sense. The date, yeah, sure. Uh, those date seems seems reasonable given where the machine learning field is at. And then the des description of the paper also sounds 
like a plausible description of the paper. But none of these papers exist. Uh, so this is kind of a, a it highlights that these the, the language model has only learned to generate language which looks like the kind of language it was trained on. And also a language which maximizes the reward from this critic it uses in the later stage. But it has no notion of facts. So the, the model cannot say whether uh, a statement is true or not. So for, for example, here's two, two sentences that the scientists saw the aerodynamics of bumblebee flight in the early 2000s. Or according to scientists, bumblebees should not be able to fly. It cannot say that any of these statements is true or not, or that any of them is based on fact or not, because that's that's something which there is no notion of fact. There's no notion of a world external to text, uh, apart from the reward it gets from, from giving good answers. So it can learn what kind of texts look like uh, factual text. And a lot of time it will be correct. So if you ask it, you know, <laughs> If you ask it about, about bumblebee flight, it will get it correct. It will say, this is a common myth uh, that, that scientists don't know how bumblebees fly. It's uncertain where it, where it learned this. But uh, it doesn't know anything, really. Uh, it doesn't know anything about facts. I shouldn't say that it doesn't know anything. Uh, that's anthropomorphizing it. Uh, it is a, a machine, and it, it builds this, this super complex die, uh, dice which it can throw to generate really good text. Uh, but we probably shouldn't shouldn't try to ascribe it more, uh, more than that. And in all honesty, we don't really know how it works inside. Now, this is, of course, an issue uh, because people start to think of ChatGPT as some kind of authoritative source on on knowledge. And it will work for a lot of cases. It is a really good way of trying to, <laughs> to probe an area uh, to see kind of, you know, what are the things in this is in this area and I know nothing about. But when you start to delve deeper, especially if you're an expert, you see that it, it kind of it has issues because it will be wrong and it will be confidently wrong. It doesn't give the user an indication of whether it's making up references or actually using using existing references. Because if you ask it for seminal papers on machine learning, it will give you a list of, of existing really good paper on machine learning because they are so prevalent. Uh, or machine learning is something which there has been written a lot about on the internet. So can we solve this? And yes, we can. Uh, and I think this is perhaps what we'll see next in, in what these models will do. And Google's BARD model already has some of this capability, although it seems to be lacking. Um, not there quite yet, but it will get there, uh, I'm sure. So this is what's called retrieval enhanced transform. So essentially, instead of just, uh, you know, generating the next word, we train the model to try to point out the correct source. Uh, so quite similar to the image uh, retrieval uh, reverse image search I showed you, we can have a, a database of documents, and then we can encode those documents or parts of those, those documents using these encoders to then get this kind of index into this vector space. And then we can take a query and we can try to match that to this index in the data, in this vector space using these neural network encoder models. And this way, instead of, of the model essentially being asked to, to answer answer an exam with a closed book, we're, we're allowing it to have an open book exam. And we're perhaps also enforcing it to, to only point to sections in the book, which answers the question. And this at least allows humans to, to be able to go to the source and say, okay, the, uh, we have actually sold Bumblebee flight in this paper from 2000 and, and whenever it was. So I think this is what we'll see be integrated in this, into these models in the near future, because I think people will want to start having, uh, being able to, to know where an answer comes from. Uh, we'll see when it comes, but, but I'm betting it will come. Uh, another issue which, or 
a, a related issue is then that you know, where does this database come from? Who decides what is facts and what is not? Who puts the who puts the correct documents in the database and who makes sure that they are up to date? So, for example, in 1980, uh, perhaps such a database would have had a factual document which said that the aerodynamics of Bumblebee flight are currently not yet uh, sold. And then when, when they get sold, someone has to go in there and update them. And this is a, a fundamental issue of all of the models we talk about right now. And that is really what data is used to train. <clears throat> so when it comes to GPT or chat GPT, we don't know exactly, but likely it uses similar data to what was trained, what was used for chat, uh, GPT-3. And that is essentially a huge amount of data uh, scraped from the internet. And they rely in particular on something called web text. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about web text. But there is this ongoing non-for-profit project called Common Crawl with the goal of uh, essentially gathering all of the text on the internet. This has then been used to try to create this huge data set. So 410 billion tokens, that, that's that's an insane amount of tokens. So tokens, think of those as roughly words. They are a bit smaller, so it's not exactly 510 billion words, but it's still a lot, a lot of text. Uh, but to try to get a good kind of text, uh, if you take any arbitrary text on the internet, it will likely be be really bad text. So what they do then is that they, they created it, this web text corpus, which uh, starts with a website called Reddit. So for those of you who don't know Reddit, it's essentially a, think of it as, as a, an evolved message board where there's a lot of different, what's called subreddits, uh, where you can post things. So these messages are typically uh, links to some other site, or they might be some kind of internal uh, question for the message board, essentially. And then users uh, rate these messages. So you can upvote uh, by clicking the up arrow or downvote by clicking the down arrow. And by this uh, mechanism, interesting things uh, pop to the to the top while uninteresting things become uh, kind of uh, depressed and, and go away uh, and then they what they do did here is that they used this message board to look for outgoing links so links going out on the large world wide web to as a proxy for good content so content which people are interesting interested in reading <laughs> And it should be have at least a certain number of upvotes. Enough humans uh, should have voted it as interesting. So this is not just uh, three upvotes in total. This this uh, depends on how many downvotes as well. So three karma is not just three people who have who have upvoted it. Uh, so in the end, they they got a lot of text. So this was this web text was then used to essentially train a neural network to to tell whether text was from web text or from common crawl, and then used to try to find high quality text in common crawl. By doing that, they ended up with a lot of data. But here is one of the first issues we will, which we'll talk a bit more about after the the break, and that is that this way of doing it uh, introduces a severe bias. So, for example, Reddit is mainly used by Americans. So over 50%, it's hard to read here, but over 50% is American. Then you have about 7% uh, from the UK, uh, about the same from, from Canada, and then Australia and then Germany. So you see that it's, it's dominated by English speaking uh, countries. Also, it's heavily skewed towards a male audience or male usage, where about, uh, according to these statistics as well, uh, at least 63% are male. And it also have a, a skew towards young users. So it's really not a representative uh, section of the whole population. And what is the whole population? Is it the whole world? Is it, is it just the West? Is it you know, just the English-speaking countries? When this model is used then to, to uh, extract the data, which is then used to, to train, these large language models, you can see where, where we're heading where, when it's coming to bias. So let's get to, to the 
bit more harder to to pin down topic, but I'm I'm just calling it wider implications. Uh, and this is just a very small sample of wider implications because I think there are so many, especially when you when you think about what these things mean um, for humans. Uh, so first of all, let, let's start with uh, some controvers controversies. So the uh, image generating uh, tools have become really powerful. They have become so good that that you can actually, uh, as a complete, you know, uh, illustration, um, should we say, idiot. Um, I mean, not as as a computer scientist, you can still create a really a good. Uh, illustration-based thing. Uh, and to the right here is an example of a, a computer scientist who created using both ChatGPT and uh, MidJourney, one of these image generation generating services. He generated a children's book for his daughter, uh, which he then, then published uh, on the web. And of course, this, this really highlights an issue here that, that suddenly uh, all, the, all the skill uh, needed to create these kind of images becomes uh, a, are threatened in a very real way because if if suddenly anyone can can generate images of this quality uh, and then perhaps just need some some touch ups circumventing much of the of the skill and time needed by a, a real graphical designer then then the question is is what will happen to graphical designers. So this has really sparked debates when it comes to to the art field. And another example is a a digital piece of art. Now this was done by a, a computer game artist. So the person who did the Theatre d'Opera Spatial. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation. This was submitted to the uh, Colorado State Fair and won first prize. It was. Uh, done so with the explicit mention that this is generated by AI. And the jury thought that this was a really interesting contribution. Uh, not only you know the image itself, but the fact that it was made not completely by AI. So the 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 human uh, who collaborated with Midjourney in this case spent upwards to 80 hours working on this this piece. So likely there were a lot of post-processing involved as well, where where he uh, went in and actually uh, did things himself but a majority of the work was done using ai this also sparked a lot of con controversies because it is the same kind of question uh, what does this mean then for people whose livelihood depend on being able to do these kind of things and i think we we couldn't talk a bit more about creativity and perhaps why we do things but i think it, it's important at least with my background that there is uh, ways for for humans who create uh, beautiful things uh, to to be supported doing so. And this is perhaps directly in conflict with that. Now there's a, a more, let's say, um, hard issue here. That's the issue of uh, actual copyright. So data used to train these models are scraped from the internet. So both for chat GPT and for, for these image generating models. Uh, copying data in this manner is typically protected or an infringement of copyright. So you're not allowed to copy a thing from the internet. There are exemptions from this. Otherwise, uh, you would, would not be able to uh, use the internet at all, <laughs> since you need to copy anything you, any image you see in the, on the internet is copied to your web browser uh, to be able to be displayed to you on your phone or on your computer. Uh, so there are circum there are exemptions from this uh, this uh, infringement of copying things from the internet. But now this using these copying these things from the internet, collecting them in a database, locally on your computer, you're not exactly uh, dispute distributing them to other people, but you are making a copy without the consent of the copyright owner. Uh, so at least when it comes to to questions whether you, you can browse the internet uh, in the e EU, uh, there have been uh, cases on this. Uh, 
there have not, not yet been any cases determining where, where AI stands in this. So the question is kind of what, what is what is a fair use of work to cr- create some transformative work of art? Uh, so you're allowed to kind of use uh, use other works of art if you create something uh, new enough. Uh, at the end, this is a question which is settled in court. Another thing which, another uh, legal issue is that of the upcoming EU AI Act. So at least in the EU, uh, there will be, there will come a lot of regulations uh, telling you what you can and cannot do with these kind of technologies. And one of the really important things that they, they highlight is that you must be very, uh, very, when it comes to models which can be used in high risk decision making or high risk settings and it's a pretty broad definition of what, what high risk is uh, you have to be able to very clearly show that the data you have used is uh, appropriate for the task and it's very hard to to uh, show how the these huge data sets five billion image text pairs scraped from the internet or or 400 billion tokens scraped from the internet, how these are actually relevant to the task of answering questions, for example, or, or generating images. So it, it's an open question here, uh, whether these will be in line with the AI Act. My guess is they, they will not. So in the EU, these uh, mo- developing these models might be illegal. But the question about the copyright is a really important one, I think. So. We've we've seen a couple of works. So I haven't talked about the co-pilot AI, but this is essentially an uh, autocomplete system, a very powerful autocomplete system for uh, computer programming. So you uh, you can use this uh, system to essentially make it write code for you, which is super powerful. But it is built using open source code from the largest source code repository in the world, GitHub. Uh, and none of the writers of that code has given their permission, or we'll, we'll see, I guess, but for their code to be used in this way. So it's an open question of whether this is a is copyright infringement or not. Uh, so the same team who, who started that class action lawsuit against uh, GitHub's co-pilot also now has started a, a close a lawsuit against a company who are backing one of these AI-generated tools that's called Stable Diffusion. I think they're also targeting Midjourney. I'm not sure. Because what what these things, if you if you give people access to these models, then the question is whether you're actually uh, in breach of copyright or not. An open question but we'll be watching this with, with great interest. So my bet is that we will see uh, intellectual property re- regulations start popping up, which will stop uh, people from just uh, downloading things from the internet and putting it into their machine learning models, which will likely uh, slow down progress a bit, uh, for good or bad. Uh, personally, perhaps for good. <laughs> progress will likely happen anyway, uh, but we shouldn't do it on the backs of, of people who have created all of these things. Another question is whether the things created by AI are novel things which are copyrighted by default. So uh, international copyright law essentially makes it anything uh, novel you create is automatically copyrighted. But uh, at least in the US, uh, a court has ruled that AI-created images are not uh, subject to copyright. Only human-created ones are. And I would bet that we're, we will see similar uh, rulings in other cases, since intellectual property, property law is really about trying to promote human innovation. Uh, it makes sense to, to introduce uh, restrictions on non-human created stuff. Another issue uh, which is perhaps more uh, more explicitly a question of copyright infringement, is that these models seem to actually be able to explicitly store some of the data they have been trained on. 
So these are two, two examples of two different models. So on the top right here is an example of how uh, text, uh, which was in the training data, can be extracted from these large language models. So what they do here is that they, they try a lot of different like prompts uh, and ask the model to continue filling them in. And what they found was that they can actually extract a lot of, of data from the model, uh, which was in the training data and which is uh, in some cases, sensitive data. So the bold faced things here uh, are things which are typically considered sensitive data. So named individuals and contact info, for example. This would be, would be uh, under the GDPR. Uh, distributing this kind of model could be in violation of the GDPR, uh, since there is actually uh, personal information inside this model, which can be extracted. Now, it doesn't remember everything it has seen, but it remembers something it has seen. We can actually get verba verbatim training data out of them. And the same researcher has also shown that, that the same is true for these diffusion models. So DALI, stable diffusion, and so on, that you can actually extract some of its training data. So you can get back the images it, it saw during training, some of them. Which then, the, the question of, of whether, so, so for a long time, it's been very clear that copyright uh, disallows you from redistributing a copyrighted uh, piece of work. Um, if you re, uh, you know, do things with it, then then it gets into the gray zone of trying to decide whether it's novel or not. But this is a clear case that your model is actually, in a sense, uh, compressing some of the data uh, in a lossy way, uh, so that it, it's definitely the same data. There are minor differences, but they are so similar that I, I think you could easily argue that this is copying. Still, uh, the, the jury is out on this, but I, I think this will make the case for distributing these kind of models hard. So in Sweden, uh, we have this, this uh, large project called GPT SWE. So that's SWE, where the E is replaced by three. So essentially trying to build a GPT model based on Swedish data. This is a collaboration between many partners, but but it's spearheaded by AI Sweden, and we in RISE are part of this uh, development. But there we actually get into the issues of whether we can, can we distribute this model? Uh, is it a violation of the GPT, GDPR to distribute it? Uh, so these are, are difficult questions uh, where I think we'll, we'll see it will have to be investigated in courts. Another issue we are seeing, uh, and which I'll, I will kind of uh, take back to a question of data later, is that of uh, AI generated generated content. So this is a new news item from just this week, uh, this Wednesday, where a, a prominent science fiction magazine has to close uh, or, or stop accepting submissions because they get such a, a flood wave of new submissions. And the reason for why they are getting this, this flood wave is because it's much, much easier for people to write uh, science fiction novels now, or short stories, rather. What we're seeing is kind of a, a system which accepts uh, things being overburdened by the sudden productivity increase uh, from this A model. Also, so I, I would bet that a, that a lot of it the, the mean quality has probably dropped because there are so much things which look so similar. So uh, the things generated by by ChatGPT, for example, tends to have a, a similar tone and a similar structure for the answers. Now you can make it, ask it to, to generate a novel and it will actually generate good, good prose in a lot of cases. So, so I'm not sure about the quality uh, comment. Uh, I, I've been been uh, surprised by the quality of ChatGPT many times. Uh, so this this is something where so so first it it might seem like you know uh, it's this niche thing, uh, science fiction magazine, and it's it's just you know uh, it's inconsequential things. But I think one one risk. Uh, and I'll briefly use this paper as kind of a, a as a reference for this. 
So I would highly recommend this, this report. Uh, it's called On the Opportunities and Risks of Foundation Models. So foundation model is this, this term used for this very, very large uh, neural networks which have, have been trained on these very general tasks, which can then be taken and used in, in a variety of settings. So GPT, uh, GPT-3 was an example of this. And what we're seeing with, with ChatGPT is that it's no longer perhaps taken and actually adjusted for, for things. Uh, perhaps it is uh, to ex an extent. ChatGPT is a, an adaptation of GPT-3 into a question answering system. But it's so, so general that it can actually uh, serve a lot more. Uh, so for example, you can ask it to, to try to classify documents, for example. Um, so the problem now with, with these methods is that we're essentially building these very useful tools, but these tools will have certain behaviors which will then affect uh, users. The, the, it's a question of, of what kind of harm can they actually uh, uh, introduce. And this is often, a, often discussed in the terms of biases. So. Any machine learning model will need to be biased. So bias is a fundamental part of, of how they work. But what, what we talk about here is typically biases which uh, have adverse effects on some uh, humans. Uh, so the, the kind of biases it learns is no longer just about uh, good, sensible generalization, but generalizations which might, might lead to discrimination or other kind of, of uh, harmful behaviors. So here they highlight how how there are a couple of different things from the data from the training phase, which leads to biases in the foundation models. So, for example, training data, uh, which I touched on a bit when it came to this Reddit script data, model di modeler diversity. So, who develops the model and decides uh, what biases it should have? Uh, that's a very uh, homogeneous group, typically people who look like me. Uh, and then architecture and objectives. So for example, what do we choose to optimize uh, in this model? And then they show how this, this, uh, these biases multiply essentially when we start to adapt these models to certain settings. So for example, when ChatGPT hires labelers to, to label the data or write new answers, that will also introduce biases. I think those biases are good. Uh, and from the policy document, I think it looks good. But if we imagine uh, someone else doing this, for example, some authoritative uh, regime, uh, their chat GPT will probably have a completely different bias, which we might might think of as extremely har harmful. But then there is also kind of these these unseen biases. So we we don't really know what's in the training data, and I think that's one one of the largest risks here. Uh, so if the training data is is gathered by using Reddit, for example, there will be a lot of biases there. It will be biased towards a certain part of the world, a certain language, a certain demographic. Uh, so the kind of data which is included in a data set might be skewed to things which young uh, people in the US, tend, young male people in the US tend to talk about, which then might might adversely affect the people when you use these, these methods to try to to do automatic decision-making based on text. It might treat text differently depending on whether it mentions a woman or a man. So just a slide on this, this topic we call our algorithmic bias. So I will not go through all of this, uh, or perhaps I will. So let's start with, with a top left example. Now this is in Sweden, uh, Swedish. Uh, it's an article by two former colleagues of mine where they looked at, together with the Swedish company registration office, they wanted to determine whether a description of a company and the name of the company uh, made sense or not. So in Sweden, you, you, you have to name your company in line with what your company is supposed to do. So this is all, all in Swedish, but essentially it says Magnus Cars, Fredrik's Cars, Maria's Cars, or Anna's Cars. And then the description says the same thing. The company will... Uh, will to work with cars. And then it's a distance score. The distance determines how well the, the name of the, the company and the descrip description of the company match. And what they could see is that if you change the name from a 
female or sorry from a masculine name to a feminine name uh then you see that the the scores in you know, the distance increase so the model thinks it's uh, a poorer match just by changing the name which would have nothing to do with the suitability of the the name for the company so the name of the person running it so this is an example of how how biased training data leads to a biased decision making model and how this these kind of subtle biases which it would likely be hard to to come up with this beforehand to scan through all of your uh, companies in the the whole you know hundreds of thousands of companies and become aware of this bias and then correcting for it so typically a lot of these these issues are are detected after the fact which is a huge issue when deploying this model for decision making so another example let, let's just highlight that the the one in the middle here uh, where Google's uh, computer vision system uh, completely changes its prediction of what, what thing this is. So this is one of these laser distance uh, measurer. Uh, if if the person holding it has a dark skin tone, uh, the one of the highest predictions other than hand is gum. Well, if you if you sloppily uh, try to paint that in a lighter skin tone, it changes the prediction. So of course this is not something Google has has uh, built into the system knowingly, but it has used data which contain these biases which reinforce this. So imagine this kind of system being used for automatic policing, or deciding with CCTV system deciding where to to send cops. You can probably see that you will have a, a very harmful and likely self reinforcement reinforcing loop here. That the data uh, will become even more biased because of where you uh, send your law enforcement. There are multitudes of issues uh, and examples like this, which should leave you a bit worried about, about deploying these models in, in high risk decision making. And I would argue that this is one of the main reasons for why the EU is so keen on trying to, to introduce this AI Act uh, sooner rather than later, perhaps too soon. Uh, we also talked a bit about this issue with language that that the majority of the language tra used train used to train this model is a, a vanishing minority of all languages so english dominates and also chinese uh, so these are the two the, the two languages for which these models perform the best and then with kind of with the depending on how internet savvy a population or user of a certain language is the more they will have used that language on the internet and the more it will pop up in the in these language models but a lot of languages will kind of be suppressed so a lot of a lot of languages don't even exist in this language model. but of course this uh, leads to once again perhaps a reinforcement of the usage so if your language doesn't uh, isn't included in the model it the model will perform poorly for your language so perhaps that will lead to, lead to uh, suppression of your language, for, for example, if it's a minority language, like here in Sweden, like me and Kelly, I would bet that you get much more, much better result using Swedish than me and Kelly, uh, which is a, a language talked by the uh, uh, minority language in the northern part of Sweden. So there are certainly issues with these models when it comes to actual uh, language use as well. And then, of course, the economic impacts. So this is, once again, a wall of text from the same paper. But what they say is essentially that, that <laughs> it's an open question, the economic impact these will have. But one of the, the risks is that they, they pose a risk of increasing in inequality and concentrating power. And I think we're, we're kind of seeing that here, that who can build a chat GPT? Who has the resources to to hire the labelers uh, to create the data sets necessary to train this model. Uh, it's not a small research uh, group at a university. Uh, it is the, the large tech companies for the moment, where they might already have a lot of the, this data. And the question is, you know, the, if this leads to a massive boost in productivity, does that what does that mean? So do, do artists 
uh, suddenly get paid more for their work? Um, likely not. Uh, will they be paid the same for their work, being able to have shorter work days? Likely not. And the same goes for a lot of a lot of the professions which which do things which these tools can now do. If you if your profession do things where there are lots of of data or lots of examples of that on the internet, then you are in risk of of competing uh, with these things. So these these are certainly open questions, uh, and me I'm a bit pessimistic about this. Then another question is that of uh, energy usage. So we're seeing that these models, <clears throat> it, they require vast amounts of compute power to train. So on the top here, we have an, uh, an estimate of the uh, carbon dioxide equivalents uh, uh, used or produced for training these models, where we see that GPT-3, for example, has over 552 metric tons of, of carbon uh, uh, created to train the model. And that is a lot. Uh, to compare a bit, the, the Swedish per capita average is about 10 tons per year. So it's the equivalent of uh, 50, uh, roughly 50 Swedish, uh, Swedes, uh, their carbon uh, emission per year. <clears throat> now there is an ongoing question whether it's worth it. Uh, and actually there's a lot of work of trying to make this more uh, carbon efficient or, or energy efficient. So a lot of work is spent on making more energy efficient uh, language models. And you can see that, that this paper is from Google. You can see that the middle there from <laughs> the, the GPT-3 is not from Google. So this paper is perhaps also kind of a uh, an ad. But as I said, there's a lot of work for doing these things more energy efficient, which on the large scale of things, perhaps 500 tons uh, of CO2 to, to get, this is, you train this language model once, and then you can essentially adapt it to a lot of different things using far less uh, compute power. So perhaps it's, it's more like uh, the development cost of, of a new piece of technology or development cost of, I mean, how, how much energy is spent into, into perhaps developing a new uh, electric car. A lot of energy is spent, a lot of humans work on that for a long time, so likely a lot of carbon is missed or created during that process. But in the end, the product you create perhaps uh, saves you uh, energy, or at least uh, lowers the carbon emission. That's an open question. And one interesting aspect to keep in mind when we talk about these things is, is that of uh, what's called uh, Jevons paradox, or Jeevan, not sure about the, how to pronounce it. But essentially, it was the observation that we'd increase efficiency in the burning of, of coal. The total amount of coal used did not decrease. Instead, it increased because suddenly it became much more, uh, the utility you got from, from burning coal increased. So essentially, it became more and more attractive to, to generate energy from burning coal. And I wonder whether we, whether making more energy efficient AI will will lead to a net uh, saving on the whole, or if that means that that people will use it a lot, lot more. Uh, this is an open question. I mean, we, we already see that uh, if you use ChatGPT, you're probably uh, met the the uh, high demand. We're overloaded right now. Sign saying you you unfortunately can use the service. Uh, I don't think. Uh, increasing the or decreasing the the compute necessary to run ChatGPT will lead to decrease in in compute usage in total, rather more use. So if you don't if you don't meet that wall anymore, uh, then perhaps you just use it more. So it's still an open question uh, where we are headed here, but there is there is reason to not be only optimistic when it comes to energy efficient AI. Now, on the whole, perhaps it will lead to be better or, or you know, positive things for society as a whole. But we are currently in a, in a crisis when it comes to to the climate. So I'll, I'll run this off. I'm a bit over time now, so it was good that we <laughs> was a bit ahead of, of the schedule previously. Uh, but I'll talk a bit about uh, technological progress. 
So some people talk about technological progress, especially in the field of perhaps uh, computers and computer science and computer architecture as an exponential growth. But in reality, this is typically a narrow view. So what we often actually see is that of an, an it's called a sigmoidal growth or an S-curve or an logistic curve. That in the in the beginning, you have a, a slow takeoff uh, where, you know, Technology is immature, not really working. Uh, this is where we were perhaps 10 years ago. And then suddenly people start figuring out how to make things more useful, more efficient. And you get to a point where <clears throat> where the techn technology becomes widespread. Uh, and when you're at that point, the, the mass of people now trying the technology and being interested in the technology and investing in the technology makes uh, the progress grow really, really, really fast. And during this time, the, the amount of things you can do really it increases all, all of the time. But, but suddenly you, you reach a point where the amount of exploration you need to do to explore all of the, all of the possible avenues uh, becomes a hindering, limiting factor, essentially. So while, while you could perhaps theoretically continue to, to grow very, very fast, it would be very hard to find the correct path to this continued growth. Uh, so that's that's one thing way of thinking it when it comes to to uh, coming up with new ideas. There's also the case of, of you know perhaps there are limiting factors like uh, the energy demand. Uh, uh, you reach a ceiling on the energy demand, a ceiling on physical properties. Like we're seeing, um, physics kind of stop us from making uh, processors and computers faster. There are limits to. <clears throat> to how fast a processor can can work because of physical laws and perhaps there are those kind of constraints on top of this growth which makes it typically a taper off into more of a, a slower growth uh, and i think it's better to think of technology technology like the latter example even if it's ai uh, so people might use the left curve to say that we will get to a point where we have a, an explosion of ai which humans cannot follow where ai uh, self improves. I'm I'm skeptical of that idea, mainly because the, this problem of, of the more things we discover, the more the more branches there is to to explore. So unless you can exponentially increase the number of branches you explore, uh, then you can't can't improve faster than uh, um, than this. Uh, so regarding this technology growth, uh, um, an interesting question could be, you know, where are we at right now? And this will just be speculations. I mean, we, I, th I think we are on the, on the, in the beginning. So I think uh, I've seen people say that this is like, this is like the Napster moment uh, of, of uh, at least uh, these kind of generative models. That ChatGPT is the first, the first uh, example where the public becomes aware of these technologies, where the public starts to to adopt them. But there's still a lot of technology growth left to be done here. There's still so much we can do when it comes to the models, when it comes to how we create our data, when it comes to how we build uh, build better uh, ways of learning from the data. So I think we're I think we're still early in the phase. I think we're somewhere around here. Uh, so I think the, the coming couple of years will be really interesting. Uh, they might also be really disruptive. One, so before ending this talk, uh, I'd like to end on a more positive note. And I think while we have talked perhaps more about classical creative things like writing and, and uh, images. I think there's a lot of potential of the exact same, uh, same kind of methods used in a vast area of, of uh, creativity. So there's this concept of a, of a design space. So a lot of what we do has some kind of parameters we can try to combine together. So I, I let this paper kind of illustrate the idea of a design space. So imagine that there are, there are ways you can try to build lamps. Uh, and you can try to, in this case, they try to map that into some uh, some underlying uh, performance metrics. But you could think of this as a space, the space of all possible configuration of this lamp. And then you have some constraints on that, perhaps. So the lamp should have these, you know, 
this foot and this uh, uh, stem and, and these three uh, sockets, essentially. Uh, but apart from that, you can vary them in different ways. And the ways you can vary them, that is the, the design space for this lamp. So a lot of, of creative work, especially in engineering, deals with these kind of design spaces and tries to find good, good regions of this design space. And traditionally, that has been done by, by having very knowledgeable, knowledgeable humans who, who are aware of certain points in this design space and know that they are good and have an intuition of, of other points in the design space. But it's still often a question of, of locally searching from points in, in the design space. So this uh, this illustration from a paper where they look at, at uh, creating uh, materials, uh, I think is a good illustration of this. So imagine you have this, uh, the left-hand side here, that's that's the design space. This is typically a insanely large space. This is, this is a space where the number of points in this space is more than the number of atoms in the whole universe. So exploring the space is very, very hard. You can only hope to explore uh, very, very few parts of the space. And finding, finding new, interesting designs, you typically do by taking a single step locally in this design space. Uh, you might try some completely different configuration, but still you, you will have a hard time exploring it, especially if it takes a long time evaluating each point. So what we have seen being done now in machine learning is that we try to try to build models of the the utility of this design space, being able to predict what would a point in this space, uh, what would its utility be. So we can do that to to more quickly evaluate points. So essentially, trying to be a proxy for this this slow evaluation method, but a more interesting. Uh, way is kind of going from the, the other side. So given uh, some desired property, give me examples of that, generate some designs. So I'm, I'm taking more time than I had expected, uh, but hopefully you will still get good uh, value out of this. So this is a, a illustration I typically use when I talk about the creative process. So creative process is an iterative process. And it, for humans, it's good. It's a good method to structure it in two phases. Each iteration, so iteration meaning that it's a process which repeats, uh, has two phases. An initial phase, which is an exploratory phase or an experimental phase or a brainstorming phase, where we start by creating a lot of things based on some kind of spark, uh, some kind of, perhaps it's a brief from a customer, perhaps it's an ID of, of uh, some new novel uh, research. But based on that, we have a lot of these ideas. And the more ideas we generate, uh, the more, the, the higher the chance of, of generating a good idea uh, in all of those. It will likely not be a perfect idea. But all of these experiments are essentially, they are ways of trying out our ideas. So for an artist, it's typically trying to sketch out the ideas or trying to, to form a sculpture. And for, for a scientist, it could actually be trying to run a, an actual experiment. Uh, but then when, it, when you've done this, you try to find what were the good ones. So you use some kind of, of metric to, you're, you're some kind of editor trying to find what were the good ideas. And then you use those good ideas as your starting points for the next iteration. So the more of these kind of iterations you do, the higher the quality of the experiments you do tend to be, and the higher the quality of the final thing you deliver will tend to be. And what I think we, we will see with these methods is that this brainstorming phase or this sketching phase, this experiment phase, the first phase, we can do it much, much quicker. So examples of this, for for example, DALI here and, and ChatGPT, I think are examples of uh, being able to increase the number of, of things we can test much, much faster. So for example, writing an abstract for a presentation, instead of me perhaps spending spending uh, half an hour on on a single experiment or a few branches of on, from that experiment, so a single text. I can now, in the same time, perhaps try out hundreds of these different texts, and I can can ask to make uh, uh, changes to design, and I can then feed them back into the system to to generate new things. So I think we'll see a tremendous productivity increase when it comes to these kind of things, and also when it comes to this design space exploration, 
going the other way around, as I, I talked about. So both of these are examples of this. You start with some constraint, and then you ask your model to generate an example for you. So on the on the left hand side here, we have a, a geometry generated from a CAD modeling software. So given some desired properties about about uh, robustness or you know kind of what kind of deformation should be allowed and the general uh, shape of the geometry, it's tasked to fill it, fill it in with with as using as little material as possible, but still fulfilling those constraints. And what we can also see is in the in the area of, uh, for example, drug development or molecular design. Previously, a lot of work was spent on coming up with new molecules in molecule space. So, what changes can I make to a molecule, and then testing it through some kind of of uh, computational method? But still, this this is a very uh, time consuming task because the amount of molecules you can generate is just staggering. Uh, what you can do instead is that you try to go the other way around. So you try to map from the desired properties, generate some example molecules. So I think this is a, uh, an area where we'll see AI methods being used in a lot more than just, you know, the, the traditional creative, uh, creative applications. So I have some kind of rather brief summary, but I, I do think that we we are just on the start of this. And as I mentioned that there are so many things we could try to make the models better. We, we in the AI field see so many uh, flaws in the models, which we believe there are, are improvements for. And also that the, the methods currently used, as long as we, we can hire humans to create new data, they can continue to improve in quality. So I think, uh, I think chat GPT a year from now will be even more impressive than it is today. And I think the competitors will also start to, to catch up. But then I think a, a really important question is what, what this model leads to for, for society as a whole. So there are fundamental questions about people being, uh, being supplanted by these methods. So graphical artists having struggled already will find their life even even tougher and this will not not happen over 10 years uh, this is happening at the moment and the same with with a lot of the a lot of the small text uh, used for communications all around the world uh, is also on the in in the risk and then i also think one of the fundamental issues w which leads a lot of harm is that of the data sets and how they are collected that currently they are automatically corrected from from without any control of what they actually contain. So I think this will will lead to to actual harm being done to humans. So uh, I'm way over, <laughs> but we still have time for some discussions. Uh, so thank you for listening to me. Uh, and hopefully you you got some value out of this uh, this monologue. Now please uh, if you want to, you can ask questions uh, directly, verbally, or write them in the uh, in the chat or the HackMD document. Thank you all.